four, three. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justine. Thanks for tuning in and welcome back to the Starboard Portal. Today we have Udi Gall, a world-renowned expert in sailing, a former Olympian, and currently the 420 race team coach at Peninsula Youth Sailing Foundation in Redwood City, California. Udi has nearly 20 years of sailing experience, including coaching the US Olympic sailing team in the 2012 Olympics in London and the Israeli sailing team in the 2016 Olympics in Rio. As a sailor, Udi competed in the two, 2004 and 2008 Olympics, representing Israel in the men's 470 dinghy class. He is a former world and European champion, earning 11 total medals and more than 20 World Cup medals. More recently, Udi's earned his bachelor's in psychology and communication from the IDC Herzliya and a master's degree in sports psychology from the JF, John F. Kennedy University. Today, Udi is breaking up the downwind leg into three critical moments to understand the different options one can execute to ensure a tactical advantage in line with your strategy. Please be sure to ask questions throughout this chat, throughout the presentation in the chat. This is about learning and improving your skills. And we are very excited to welcome Udi Gall um, for this presentation. So thanks for, for being with us. I personally am looking forward to this um, presentation. Um, so take it away, Udi. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. Thank you very much for you and this opportunity with the U.S. Sailing. I think what, you're do, what you guys are doing is amazing for our community, our sailing um, industry, especially in these times. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. And it's funny, like, yeah, I saw the smirk on your face when you said, I'm excited about this downwind. Maybe we should tell this story about, like, Udi, can you present? I want to hear this downwind. So this um, actually downwind philosophy a while, how I sell the downwind and what I like to, how I like to see the downwind as a sailor or as a coach. I used to be a skipper as a young sailor and then at the age of 17, I became a crew. One of the things I was confused, I like, you know, as a crew, you have to focus on spinnaker. Till today, I think I have problem with my neck. Although if you ask my skipper, he, he will tell you that I never looked on the spinnaker. And I wrote them um, and kind of an article or how I approach the sailing of the downwind just for our team. And apparently this file <laughs> walked away and start moving around, swapping hands. And two years after our friend Leo came to me, I want to hear everything about this downwind philosophy. I said, what are you talking about? And apparently this file went border ranges and a lot of people talked about it and went to a younger generation sailing program. And it's, I read it lately and I said, you know what? It's quite good. <laughs> Let's write it again in English now. So here's a, a glimpse uh, of my, some of my insight of this downwind presentation. Yes, and well, just to uh, add in, I met Udi, I mean, gosh, it may have been 10 years ago, but you were working um, with Amanda Clark and Sarah Lehan in the 470 for the um, London Olympics, and you were going over to, to start your downwind strategy talks with them, and I, I, coaching in Miami at that time, I really wanted to to hear what this was. And I think now it's eight years later and I'm finally getting it out of you. Um, so to that point, <laughs> that's why I'm excited. <laughs> exactly. So you you made me actually translate this file and poor kids, my, my sellers here in PYSF is, uh, we did a lot of Zoom meetings and use this time, this opportunity to do to walk through a lot of theory. They need to listen step-by-step. Step. This is, it's a 22 pages file and at, if people wants to get access to that, they're more than welcome to reach out to me. And they need to go step by step and to see if the, the, the phrases and the terms that I'm using are actually comfortable, understandable. There were so many additions to that until we get to this presentation. So with no more words, let's continue. Let's start and talk about it. And um, just to remember, to reminding everyone, this is, we're going to do it in two parts. Again, this is very, it's a, a it's a long it's very long discussion about the downwind and we will keep one for next week we have another another presentation next week hopefully we'll we'll be on time for this week and 
this specific presentation talking a lot about, about the, the importance of the tactical sailing. Tactical is what I like to call um, the uh, boat to boat situation and how you sail relative to your opponents. There is the strategy um, portion when you think and talk about the, the, the shift, the pressure, the current, the, the race course strategy. It's uh, how you sail the fastest the race course. But luckily or unfortunately, you are not racing along on the race course and we need to react to our opponents. And it's becoming even more important on a downwind uh, since we don't have um, any control, not too much control, especially leaders. You don't have too much control of the wind because it's coming from the back and then suddenly the people are on the back, suddenly they, they are the boat that are attacking, they are the boat that have control and you need to find a balance between how you're sailing with the free air, free air and the wind and how you actually engage to the middle and selling more conservative and protective and, and defensive. So this is a glimpse about that. That's why I focus a lot on the tactical issue, uh, situation. And like it says here, no matter how fast you are on a downwind, um, and if you have the, all your plan, your plan A is perfect and you have all the race course figured out, the current, the shift, the pressure, you know exactly what to do. If you don't execute properly these three picks that we're going to talk about, this tactical situation, no matter how fast you are, you're going to be as slow as the boat behind you. So you have to master these um, peak areas around the race course, and especially on the downwind. As I said, the downwind, not um, unlike upwind, especially as a leader, you don't have any control of the wind. So this is something that you you want to consider you cannot sail between the mark and the opponents too much you have to stay outside and clear and it's the critical timing when you're jibing into the middle when you're becoming more protective it's a very hard balance to find on a downwind and um, my philosophy is no matter how fast you are and um, you can be very fast or not i think it's very important to set this apart and you have key moments and you have like a checklist, a mental checklist that you go through your mental checklist. That's what I need to do here. And those are the things that we're going to see on this presentation. What are the questions? What are the things that you need to focus on each area of this downwind? Um, often you will see, I like to ask questions and I'm reaching out to the audience. Please ask questions all the time. Justine is here um, to relay the, those questions if needed and to stop me. And ask yourself questions while you are sailing. Ask yourself say, a question. So when you make a decision, you need to have the why and the reasoning why you're doing this action and not the other tactical action. And another thing that I'm using a lot is the phrases or cues that it's a short term, maybe a one word sometimes that explains so much for our team, especially when we go into the bigger boats with more teammates and everything. So those are the things that I would like to focus on. And that's why I'm focused, this presentation focus a lot on a tactical aspect. Although you will see, I'm not neglecting the, the, boat, the, the boat speed or the technique or the, the shifts and especially the gas and the pressure and the position. Those are super important. But again, in order to do that successfully, you need to execute the tactical situation very well. And then suddenly, even if you're not that fast, you're becoming much faster. So, what requires to have a good tactical execution? For me, the three main uh, factors is the boat handling, the technique, and again, the tactical sailing is like how you react and how you sailed relatively to, uh, uh, you have a boat speed relative to yourself, to the position and your, and, and your opponents. Let's break down the, the downwind for a few few elements. The first one is the tactical selling. That's what we're going to focus today. Is our relative boat speed? It's not how much we are selling fast. It's how well are we selling fast and angle wise, and relative to our opponents. Is the positioning near the mark? How we put ourselves in the right position relative to our opponents in order to execute again comfortable and quiet and fast the next step which is the big big chunk um the, the next part is the the downwind strategy 
again, I'm not neglecting. I think it's very important, but in, again, in order to execute that, we have to have good tactical. So of course we focus a lot about the shift. I will say that the shift on the downwind a lot because our angles on the downwind are smaller than the upwind. Most, most of the boats and most of the conditions is less important. I'm not saying it's not important, but relative to the upwind, it's a bit less important. What is very important is the gusts and lulls, how, how much we have a clear air, a good position, a good pressure. Current, of course, if we have a course with a, a, a strong current or current differences from one side to another. Again, because our angles are not that big, the split between, at, for the fleet, the split, how, it, how the fleet splits is not that wide, not that big. So the differences of the current are a bit less, but still it's a factor. The S curve that we will touch in a minute. And what we know is the 80 20 rules on the SIG. A lot of us know about it and hear about, heard about it. I will touch based on that. But I like to think actually on the down more like the third rule, like 70 or 30, I like to call it. And we will learn why later on. The technique and what we think all the time is our boat speed. Again, even the boat speed, you can sail by yourself as fast as you can. Once you start sailing around other boats, the technique is not actually that smooth. You need to react all the time and to adjust yourself relative to your opponents. And also the technique changes a little bit before and after some of the maneuvers. How we set up the boat. Of course, every condition we need to, every different condition we need to tune and adjust ourselves and, the, and, and, and our setup of the boat. How we prepare better um, all the setup in the boat and all the rig for the, after the maneuver or to, to the next phase. Um, to have a better execution. I like to use a lot of the center board often, if you can, and think about even some, some stuff like sheets that you have. If you are jabbing to a high mode, you're jabbing to a low mode, you're jabbing, sometimes you're jabbing into a reach to the last leg. This is something very important. And of course the board handling. So you can uh, master um, your jibe again, like when you're yourself, but sometimes, and I'm sure that a lot of us um, when you, you, you did your warm up with a perfect jibe, and then we're coming to the race, and suddenly the jibe is like the spinnaker collapsing, and it's not that smooth, our roll is not working comfortably, we get twisted and everything. A lot because we are changing the rhythm and the type of the jibe while we are sailing against our near our opponents. And this is something we have to learn how to adjust our jibes, or adjust our sets, douses. Everything is easier when you're sailing by yourself. Um, but all those elements are different when we are sailing next to other boats and it's becoming much harder and much more challenging. So let's go even deeper about the boat handling. When we are thinking about the jibe, like I said, when we are sitting in the open sea by ourselves, we will going to have the perfect jibe. And if we train hard, we have very successful jibe. But when we are sailing in the, in the fleet, in the mix of the boat, you need to have few types of jibes in your toolbox. Jive from high mode to low mode. Jive from high mode to high mode. Jive, jive from low mode to low mode. Jive from high, low mode to high mode. You have to adjust that. And sometimes you will need to adjust it while you're in the jive. Let's say you're jiving and there's another boat jiving next to you. You have to, or to change the mode to high high mode, maybe to go uh, around the, to windward, or maybe to so low deeply to to make some separation and to open a gap between you and the other boat. A lot of those jibes, a lot of how we adjust those jibes or other techniques in the boat, is depending on the actions of our opponents, and this is something very important to understand. There is what I call dynamic situ situation. Um, every time that the, 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 your opponent, especially, I'm I like to, to think about this downwind uh, when you are leading. But again, I said, there's always the opposite situation when you're on the back. So the thinking just need the mental thinking need to be the opposite. But whenever the opponent engage or attack you or even make mistake, there is opportunity. You, you can react or defend or sometimes 
other situation open up. So you have to be ready for any kind of dynamic situation. Um, of course, it's not us. It's not like, okay, are you ready to jive? Three, two, one, let's jive. We need to sometimes to be ready and to react right away. This, this sailing all the time at downwind, the opportunity comes suddenly and we need to be ready for all, the, all those kind of dynamic situation. Lastly, on the boat handling um, transition, when we're thinking about the, the tactical uh, factor of the, of, the, of the downwind, it's a very short window of opportunity, sometimes less than a second. And every, set, situ, every second that we are sailing, and every, every, every portion, every, every way that we are doing in the water, a new situation arises, a new situation comes. So we need to adjust and change our transition. Sometimes, good example for that, even when we are sailing straight line, we are not changing. We don't react to the opponent. The opponent are not changing anything. We didn't do anything. But just sailing straight, you're kind of crossing the, the, the middle line, what I like to call the middle line between the, 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 the top mark and the bottom mark. You're becoming from the left. You're sailing a second ago, we were on the left-hand side of the downwind, and suddenly you're going to the right-hand side of the downwind. So your mental thinking or you, the next action or your aim or goal should be completely different when you are coming, when you are on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the downwind, especially on the bottom, which we'll learn next week on the, 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 the black diamond, what I call it. The technique. Again, like I said, everything is very short and we are setting against our opponent. While we are adjusting to, to our opponent, the, 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 the adjustment, the, the, the technique changes, the, the variety, the transition becoming very an, an important factor. So when we are thinking about that, it's not like we are sitting in our own world and we have to react all the time. We all the time think that we want to sail um, as fast as we can. We will learn that some of the situation and often you actually want to slow down, especially when we are in a situation of what I like to call the sandwich. You don't want to sail too fast. You don't want, you don't want to dig into the little the side of the boat ahead of you to get trapped in their bad air. And then the opponent, suddenly the opponent in the back have the, the advantage. So often you want to actually start, even sail slower and to have the control with the boats in the back, have the space a little bit from the boat in the front. Again, like I said, um, unlike the other legs on the course, you have less control on the wind. And we, we will want to find the balance between having sailing with the clear air and a good pressure and going into the middle and protect our race course. So in order to do that, the technique, how we adjust, how we sail in the bad air, how we sail in the tough lanes, sometimes is super important. And especially in the downwind, because what we have on the, the difference in the downwind is uh, our variety of, of angles are, are quite wide. We can say on the low mode, we can say on the perfect VMG, we can say on the high mode, and all of them, all three of them have pros and cons, but at the end of the day, they quite bring you to the same spot. And, but it means you have a variety of angles and also your opponent and the technique can be adjustable quite a lot, not like upwind. Do we have any questions so far? I'm more than happy to pause here for a minute and have some questions. Um, well, Udi, I was just thinking it may be a good idea. You just mentioned being in the sandwich position on the downwind, maybe explaining a little bit what that looks like, but then going into how managing the tempo of your boat against other competitors um, when they come at you, kind of how you get to that level in your sailing so that you are able to to manage the tempo and it's not just a complete reactionary. Um, maybe from a psychological standpoint, um, definitely from a boat handling preparation standpoint. So first of all, in my philosophy and how I like to approach it, sandwich is not good for us. It's good for lunch break, <laughs> but not good to sell in a sandwich. And we, can, we are going to touch based on that a bit more 
later on. But at the end of the day, when you're on a sandwich, first of all, there is all the boat in the back, all the boat in the front have control on you. So you have less control. And also if the right hand side, the windward side, the outside area, potentially gaining more than the inside. So you're not there, the other boat is there. And if the inside potentially will gain later on, you're also not there, the other boat, the third boat is over there, or the rest of the fleet. So one of the things is, first of all, is the mental aspect that you don't want to be in the, in the, uh, on the sandwich. One of the things I like to do in technique wise, actually sometimes slow down. And I, was, I used to do it a lot with my teammates. Hey, let's slow down. Let's stay with the boat in the back. Especially if you're confident with the boat speed, let's hold the boat in the back. And you can do a lot of techniques. You can slow slow very aggressively. You cannot push very hard with them on the ways. You can choke a little bit, over trim yourself a little bit, to sell a little bit. I'm not saying that stop the boat completely. Just to have the boat in front of you, a little bit of separation. So you can punch forward when you can, or maybe the boat behind you, maybe because they are like uncomfortable with how slow you are, they will jibe out. And then suddenly you don't have the boat behind you and to jibe, uh, to, to sit on you and hold uh, and hold you, have fights with you on, or to catch you on the jibe. There is opportunity. Sometimes it's a couple of waves. You want to find those opportunity to get out as soon as possible to get out from the sandwich situation. And you need, again, if you look for that, if you mentally say, okay, I'm in a sandwich, I have to get out of there. You will find your opportunities to get out of there technique wise or boat handling wise. Okay, so we continue. Yeah. Um, the way I like to break the downwind, as you see on this image, is to three major peaks. The first peak is a top rounding, and what I as I call a top rounding, but it's not actually the running the mark. We have the end had the handoff, but we will touch again soon. I will explain about that. And the set, it's before you, you can see the the handoff is been becoming before maybe sometimes two to three hundred feet before the top mark. The top, the running itself and the set. So one one of the things I did on this presentation, I color code those three peaks. So the, this peak, when we are talking about the first peak, it will be blue. The green area, which I will not touch too much today, again, what we call the strategy or the big chunk where we want to be uh, very fast and to master your, um, your strategy. Hopefully you have the right plan, you, you nail down the race course properly. So in order to, this is the big chunk, it's like 60 or 70% of the downwind. And then the second peak here on this image, we can see it on the right hand side of the downwind on near the lane line over there or close to the lane line, but it can come and it will see later in few other opportunities during the downwind, but that's the second peak. And the third peak, what I like to call the black diamond is, um, is the last bit of the, of the downwind. So again, remember those color code, it will maybe it will help us to understand better later on. When we are focusing on the, on the tactical aspect on those peaks, there is what I, what I want to ask, remember, like I said, there is a question that we want to ask us. So on the top rounding, the first peak, what are the questions that we want to ask? So one, one of the big things that I would like to ask is, especially on the, on the handoff, what is my plan for a downwind? Don't come, just get around the mark, set the spinning here. Oh, wait, what am I doing? Have a plan, have a plan A, and possible if you have a plan B and C, it's perfect. In order to do it successfully, you want to do it before the mark. The second question that you want to ask yourself on this peak is like, where do I want to position myself right after the mark? How do I want to see myself after I finish the set, after I finish all the running, which is very hectic? On the second peak, the time for what I like to call the time for jibe, time to jibe. One of the biggest questions is like I like to ask is, uh, am I in the outside boat, the wind boat, boat the, the far away boat from the middle or the inside boat or the inside boat? So we have to understand where are you relative to the opponents or the, the pack of boats and what are our options when we are outside or inside or definitely not the sandwich. Big question, and we'll touch again on that later is, 
where do we want to be? How do we want to look like after the journey? Sometimes I like even to pay a little bit price, not to find the perfect position of the jive in order to have perfect position on the next stack, on the next leg often, and the big, the next big chunk. I'm not going to talk a little bit too much about the third pick. Again, it's for next week, is the black diamond. And the reason this is a new addition for the, the, the file, uh, for this philosophy of Darwin, I am from Israel. We live in a desert. There's no any ski. Since I moved here to the United States, I'm skiing much more. And when I start skiing, I said, ah, the black diamond is too hard for me and everything. Slowly, slowly, I learned it's actually doable. And that's how I kind of call the bottom of the Darwin, the black diamond. I definitely don't want to see uh, two black diamonds too hard for me. Let's focus. If we don't have questions so far, we can move on to the next and start breaking down the, the, the three peaks. We good, Justine? Yeah, we. I mean, there's one question. Um, I, I can tell you it, and then maybe you can decide answer it now or a little bit later. Um, yes, it's from do. our good friend Bernat. Um, he's just asking, how would you approach from an opti coach perspective the decision making when it comes to sailors, as many of them, often guided by coaches, really push the downwind lay lines? We're going to touch it a, a very a very soon. The, the, the difference a little bit with the optis and especially lasers are we, we are not spread out so much. One of the things that actually I see often on the downwind, on the optis again, because they are younger generation is like follow the leader. And I think if again, we are going to this question of what I asked earlier is what is our plan to do in the downwind or to have this question, to have them, have them map their sailing and sometimes even stop them before the top mark. Okay, what, uh, what is your plan of the downwind? So I'm not even asking if you're on practice before, before the downwind. What is your plan A for the downwind? Have your hand off? Have your like, and then you can operate best top running. And again, try to all the time ask yourself what you want to do next. All the time trying to take two or three uh, steps uh, forward. And I hope that's answered. And I will touch a little bit the lie line very quickly. Yeah, perfect. And he just, he does follow up with, um, saying their only goal for them is to escape the big crowd while really forgetting about what you said with positioning yourself around the fleet. Um, so just with that in mind, just what would your coach approach be? Um, so I, yeah, I so, the Opti crowd's its own unique. <laughs> again, so that's what I said. Everyone, it's, uh, it's a trend in a younger generation to follow the leader. Um, I see so many times if you kind of, I think the key is actually to get to yourself, to get to his mind. And it's hard when you're a younger sailor. I, I remember my days as a young sailor. And for us, it seems so reasonable, but they have so much going on for them. But if we, we need to find a way to let them stop and think. And it's not, it's not too complicated, but just they, they forgot that all the time in, in the pressure of the race, they like, and also as adults, we are on the same, stop and think. If, you, if they will be able to stop, okay, what do, am I trying to achieve over there? And not just blankly follow the leaders, you already need, did 90% of the job. Our goal is actually, to, they, they know the answer. If you give them the, all the, the elements and in the, in the info, information of the downwind, when they are calm on the shore, on a, on a whiteboard, 90% they will give you the right answer. The key, the most important thing is on the water to find the way Tell them, okay, what is your plan for the downwind? Why are you going to go? Why do you want to go right or left? Why do you want to start on a high mode or a low mode? Where are the opponent, opponents and where do you want to put yourself against the opponents? So let's start, and especially here, maybe it will answer some of the, uh, those questions. And the first peak is the top running and what I like, they call the handoff on the set. As we saw that the green part or the upwind, we talk a lot about the, we focus a lot about the strategy, the shift, the gas and everything. The last shifts you already, you, you need to know to follow the, the shifts, but here you kind of forget for a second, let out. I like to have the mental, uh, uh, like a mental list and to understand what is important now. Actually now at the moment, the strategy drop down on, the, on this priority list. 
And what I want to focus now is very tactical situation, boat to boat, where are the opponents, where I'm putting myself around the opponent, and what is the right boat handling and technique around the top mark. Um, prior to this area, again, when we are getting close, then naturally, when we are getting close to the marks, we are, it's becoming much more crowded and hectic. So when we, if we are trying to do the handoff now and to make the decision, that's why I told you, Bernard, earlier to have them stop and think before the mark. If we're trying to make the right decision, oh, what is, what is, what is the right, um, what, is, what is the shift now? Are we on the right shift, on the left shift? Is the mark on the right or the left? Where is the next mark and where is the next pressure? If they try to do it while they're on the running area, on the top mark running, there is no way, it's too hectic over there. There is no way, even if they think about it, it's too hard to make the right decision. So what I like to make is the handoff, the decision before you collect all the information that you know so far from the start, from the upwind, what was gaining on the upwind, which leg was longer, where was more pressure, where, what is what what shift am I now? And then with this information, you can have more chances to have the right decision toward the downwind. From that point on, it's becoming hectic. And some of the boats, we have the set, which is even more complicated. And then one design fleet is very hectic over there. And then we have the next step. And then again, one of the question is, what is our goal? You have to know where do you want to put yourself right after the running in order to execute your high boat speed. And back to Bernard's question, if I have a boat sitting on my tail and taking me to a, a mile or half a mile of fight, so like all the time get, heading up and heading down, heading, it means we didn't do a good job around the, uh, the top running. And all the down, instead of focusing on our boat speed on the right shifts, we're focusing how to defend ourselves from the boat behind us. Like I said, there is the big chunk, what I like to call the big chunk, and even say sometimes in the boat, okay, we are changing our mindset towards the big chunk now. Now we can focus on high boat speed and the strategy. And like I mentioned earlier, our position or higher pressure or clear air, sometimes is more important from the, than the perfect shift. If you are facing, just like I said now to Bernard, if you are facing on this big chunk area, some fights with a boat behind you, a pack of boat behind you, or a knowing sailor that like driving you crazy, or you have the wrong decision making, it's most likely you did a mistake on the earlier stage, on the top running. You didn't put yourself on the right position and now you cannot execute your perfect boat speed and strategy. The second pick is the time to jive. On this, again, on this uh, illustration, this image, it's only, only on the right-hand side, uh, but we'll have, we have those time of jive a few times or, along the downwind. Here is the, it's, it's the, it's the, I think what's important here is to find a balance between what is the strategy, where do I want to go, do I want to continue a bit more and to settle with the clear air outside, in the outside area of the course, or I want to start digging to the middle, start protecting the middle of the, 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 the race course, trying to be more protective between you and the fleet and the, and the next mark. There is no any one way to do it, but remember that you need to find this right, right balance. What I like to do here is to think about where am I now? Like we said earlier, am I on the outside boat? Am I on the inside boat? And how the situation leading me? Potentially, if I'm the outside boat, it will lead me to all the way to the ley line. And then when I'm jiving on the ley line, um, People will might jive on top of me, and then I'm then the next 50% of the, the leg, the, the last 50% of the leg, there's people on top of me, and I'm in a bad air. So sometimes what I like to do is actually to prioritize the next leg, even paying a small price on the last bit of the earlier leg in order to have better position on the next big chunk. The last bit is the black, uh, uh, the, the black diamond. And again, we're not going to dig in that today. As you see, there is a handoff before that, and potentially it's very, very crowded, and it's very, very, it's becoming more complicated. So we keep it for next week, but that's the last peak of the down. So here is what, well, if we are thinking now again, we're going back again to the first peak, to the, the, the set, to the top one rounding. I like to see it. Obviously there is a bit more than that, and as you, becoming higher level, 
there is few more version, a few more tools on your toolbox, but I like to break it down to four, four types of sets. And one of the things that I learned with my Olympic experience as a sailor, as a coach, it's amazing how when you, you're becoming more experienced and better seller and more expert, it's actually if you are falling into this trap of becoming more too much, the situation is too complicated and you have too many tools in the box, you don't know which tool to do it. So the key is sometimes even simplify that. So that's why I like to think about it as a four set. And that's why I, I told you when I read that this article now almost 20, almost 25 years after, I like, wait. Some of the things are actually brilliant here. Some of the things are so simple that it's actually still true for the top sellers in the world. So the first set is the set number one. Uh, it's a long starboard. Uh, it's mostly when you're saying 90% on starboard, maybe you have a jibe, sometimes you don't have a jibe. And the way to think about it actually is like a reach. The only thing you care about is to have a clear air after the set and you're avoiding any fight. It's a high mode. You're doing a, a set to a high mode. And I will give you even tips. Sometimes you actually want to sell in, even further away, maybe another one board, one half boarding after the mark and the board behind you, you're like, what the heck is he doing? He's not sailing to the right direction. I will just run the mark and go to the leeward and then you actually trap the board behind you and on the leeward, on the leeward and then you have control on them all the way on the long starboard. Let's watch a short illustration about how we want to see the boat at the end of the downwind. We are the blue boat. And our goal is actually the boat, as you see, we continue a bit over the mark. And our goal is, this is how we want to finish the set. We want to finish the set when the boat behind us trapped on the leeward side and we have a clear layer. And they actually, they're so not comfortable in this uh, position. They actually will soak even lower. And then the downwind, the long star will becoming much more comfortable and it's perfect because 90% you're sitting on your star. The second set is what most likely all of us know is what you're doing. The regular set, even by yourself, is the, the open down. You don't know how long you will continue on starboard. You don't know how early you will jibe. You want the both of the options to continue on starboard or to jibe early. It's what I like to call the optimum BMG. And where we want to finish this uh, set is somewhere between on, on the bow of the boat behind us, or maybe a bit higher just to prevent any fights or temptation for the boat behind us to go for a long fights along the downwind. Again, same two boats, we are the blue boats around the top mark and we are staying somewhere on the bow of the other boat. And as you see, on this situation, we most likely we can continue forward on starboard quite comfortably, and we have the access to jive early if we need it. Not that early, but later on. So right after the set, we can do a reassess the situation. Do we want to continue? Maybe where the shift during this set or this crowded area, maybe the fleet is jiving to the other side, so we want to stay with the fleet. So you have both of the options. So the third type of jet, uh, set is the early jive and the low mood. And the reason is we actually set on starboard here, not doing a jibe set is like potentially on the jibe set, there is, and um, if you see my mouse here around this mark, because a lot of boats are coming on starboard around leeward to this mark, there's like a very dreadful um, triangle with no air, no pressure, and you don't want to jibe there. This is one of the reasons also when you're doing a jibe set, most of the boat, when they are doing a jibe set, the, we measure that the, no matter how good you're doing a jibe set, most likely you will lose one to two board lengths, sometimes even more. So you want to do a set to a low mode, just an early jibe. Maybe sometimes you, you know that you want to just sail on the left-hand side of the course, but you have a left shift. So you want to do the, take the best, make the best out of this shift and then jibe early. So you just jibe and our outcome should be, we are somewhere on the bow of the boat behind us, even to the leeward maybe temper them to go a little bit higher than you, even roll you a few seconds after, so you can do an early jive out. So you're actually soaking low right after the set. The next step 
is uh, set number four or the jibe set, what we like, a lot of us like to call. It's when usually it's a, when we have a long port or a big advantage if it's by pressure or big shift, big right shift or current wise, we want to do a jibe set. Now, usually, like I said earlier, we are using, potentially we're using one or two board lengths on a jibe set, especially if we're jibing into this a very painful um, triangle with no pressure, we, we will lose some board lengths. We will have to remember when we are committing, commi committing to the jibe set, we have to make sure that the, the long board, the left-hand side of the downwind will give us back the two or three board lengths that we lost in the beginning and even more. Another one thing that I want to focus on that, you will see on this uh, illustration when you're doing a, a jibe set, you're actually heading up after the jibe and again, trap the board behind you to say, what the hell is he doing? I want, he's going on a high mode. I will take the leeward, uh, leeward lane and then you have control on him all the long board after the jibe set. Also remember you're jibing to a high mode because there is less pressure at this area because of the, most of the upwinds coming on starboard. So you're jabbing, going on a high mode and tap the board behind you to go to the leeward. And this is how you want to see the, this is how you want to see the outcome of the, of the set. Any questions so far on the sets? Let's see if there is any questions on that. Yes, so Udi, one question. When, in the, when on the mark approach, are you deciding which um, situation you're going to pursue? Kind of what's the, the thought Good process? question, very good question. And I like to see it here. When we are still like this is where well, what I call the hand the handoff. And somewhere here on this line, when you were sailing upwind, you can see my marker, right? You have the handoff where we are still in the upwind before you are coming to this last triangle, before you are coming to this engagement of all the boats together, the 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 hectic and crowded area. While you're still comfortable, you want to kind of okay, collect the information from the reach from the last uh, sorry from the last upwind, collect the information what you had before the race, have your main plan, put it together and see what is your plan for the downwind. This is your plan A. Obviously, things not always on your control. Things can be changed from the time that you are here before the mark. It's probably 20 seconds, half a minute, sometimes more, sometimes less until you finish the set. And in this time, often we see sailing, the weather change, we have a big shift, the offshore wind, we thought there was a pressure is on one set until we finish the set, the pressure moved to the other hand. So you need to, to be able to have the plan B and um, change and execute different plan and to adapt to what happened after. But again, we're doing a plan A we're going into this quiet area where it's very hectic. We are dealing a lot of boat handling, boat to boat situation. And right after the set, you reassess if what you thought before the set, before the mark is still apply at this moment after the set. I hope it's answering the question. Yeah, no, awesome. Well, and I think also when you're um, with your plan B, you're also kind of it's important to go through what would cause a shift from plan A to plan B so that, especially when you're sailing with multiple people, everyone's on the same page for those quick um, changes. Yeah, so I, I love to have, it's, it's, it's not easy. Sailing is not easy and it was, if it, and if it was so easy, it, was, it will be much harder. Um, I like to have all the time plan A and plan B. And like I mentioned on the set, there is a range where you want to put yourself so you can always kind of tweak and adapt and adjust to plan B. You cannot always commit it. You have to all the time be flexible and, and adjustable to things that comes up along your way. The second peak. Well, where, before you move yes. on, we, we do have one more question on that first peak um, from Frank Hobson. Is there a significant difference in boat handling technique for the first three sets or is it just a change in your heading? Um, there is some differences. It's a good question. The, the three sets are very similar. It's more about your position, where, where you want to put yourself, relative to the other board. But 
there is differences. So if you go on a high mode, for example, most likely it's almost a broad reach. So your, your sheets and set and the amount of pressing, let's say you're you going to top around the top mark, you want to press the ball to help the ball to steer down. And how much you press, if you go on a high mode, you don't want to fully press the ball because you want to maintain some pressure and maintain a high board speed going forward. You don't want to do full strong maneuver all the way down and then head up. And also the sheets, it's almost like a ridge. So you don't want the wind watch it click too much. You want to be able, you need to be ready to trim the lead watch it more than usual. You don't want to rotate the spinnaker all the way to the back, send the board a bit lower. And main sheet need to be trimming a bit more. You don't want to ease the main sheet all the way out because it will have a back wind from the, from the spinnaker. And the opposite, and if you are going to the long one, you don't want to have a lot of power while ro uh, running to, to a low mode. Then it means you pulling the rudder much more and you have much more uh, friction in the water. You actually want to help a lot with your body weight so low and have the best low mode running. You have to be ready to square the main, the, the spinning care much more right after the set, take it out a lot, take it back a lot and to ease the, ma the main sheet a lot so the boat will sail fast and powerful on the low mode. So those three sets different, but it's more about our positioning and you need to adjust your technique towards that. Great question. Awesome. Uh, um, we're moving now to the next uh, peak. And again, we're going to talk about the way that we saw it. It's only one area of the jive, but it comes in two or three times during the downwind and we're going to see it in a minute. Some of the things we want to focus on the second peak. Um, the S curve. There is a lot of approaches how you want to see our downwind. And it was very, very interesting to see, I think Muller um, was here a few weeks ago and he was talking about the, the 29er and the skiffs. And you can see that their downwind is much more separate, much more outside. And you, have, you try to, to hit the ley line quite good. And it's a, different, a little bit different approach on a high mode boats and the laser and opties. So, but uh, the way I like it, and it's, I think it's accurate, it's just different width of the, the S curve. I like to see an S curve on a down, especially an S kind of type on S, we're going to see it in a second, type of an S, especially until a black diamond. If you think about it, there is like a few types of, on S and you can see that the, the if you connect it to the set, you can see the thin line here. It's the long starboard. Obviously, we put only one, but it's a very long starboard. Then you jibe in. It's uh, the set, two thirds of the downwind. You want to do a jibe. So it's the open VMG, the early jibe in or the jibe set. And so you can see that the, the, there is few peaks coming here. If it's those three peaks, time for jibe. And one, two here, and maybe another two on the back before we are coming the black diamond and naturally you see this black diamond is becoming super crowded, especially because the fleet was kind of holding one each other together. So it's much more crowded over there. The fleet is coming together and often we see packs of boats coming very slow to the bottom gate. Um, but we have the S here, we have the S here and we have the S here. We have like four type of S. Obviously there is sometimes another two, one or two steps in the, in the way, but when if you have the tracking device with a GPS, you most likely, I would like to see as a coach, the S curve of the downwind. Again, it's different from one boat to another. Skis or asymmetric spinnaker, you will see more outside sailing, like the, the, the outside S here, lasers and then um, the Opti, single high boat, they will sail or fin, they will sail more in the less high angle, more like straight, but you will still see some S curve, a small S curve on the downwind. One important thing is like what I learned a lot from the 420, 470 and even big boats on the symmetric spinnaker is all the way to the bottom tri um, black diamond. Usually you want to see two or three jibe, maybe even sometimes even one, depends on the condition, strong condition, lighter condition, more shifty, less shifty. If you are doing, and I'm not talking about the last uh, bottom, um, black diamond, if you are doing more than two or three jibe all this way down, unless it's like super shifting, super gusty day, 
and medium wind, which you don't lose a lot on the jibes, something is most likely is wrong. So ask yourself how many jibes you did and understand why and think where you could reduce or get rid of a couple of jibes along the way. Sometimes you have to, again, it's not always on your control. It depends a lot of how the fleet reacted, but that's important factor. There is the 18 20 rule. And this is actually when the times to jibes come. Often we like a lot of say, coaches and sailors like to call it 80 or 20, stay out of the ley line, don't sail 100% of the way all the way to the ley line. On the app, when you want to think about 80 or 20, on I like to call it the third rule or the 70, just because again, I like to use keywords and phrases, and it's actually staying away more than the app when actually 30% of the of of the way to the ley line. And the reason for that is that again, the fleet often jibe on you. If you jibe in, the boats behind you will jibe on you. So you want a, a bit more extra space. If someone is jiving you on your bed lane, you want to jibe again and have a, a good comfortable area to get out of this difficult situation. And another reason in and downwinds, not like upwind that we are kind of fixed on the 40, 45 degrees. On a downwind, our variety of angles, like I said earlier, it's, it's big. So you can say almost, especially on the symmetric spinnaker, almost dead run and by the lee, sailing straight down. And sometimes you can say almost on a broad reach. And those two types will bring you almost to the same point, depends on the condition of the situation. So when you're jibing on a 20%, if someone is jibing on you and both of you are talking low, you can end up sometimes over the ley line. So that's why you, you want to jibe a bit earlier. Two things you want to think about here, and we'll see in a second how and why, is the if you are on the outside, the windward boat, the, the far away from the middle boat, and what you want to do with that. Sometimes a lot of sailors like to stay there and to stay as long as they can with a clearer and um, good pressure outside of the race course. There's a pros about it. You have a great wind all the way down. And then the cons is actually that you get stuck on the ley line potentially and when you're jiving and you're trying to jive inside, the fleet is covering you. And again, you have to understand what you want to do with that. And if you want to commit to this outside lane or maybe think about earlier, find an opportunity to jive in or to do maybe a step inside and to find a better position towards the next, next stack, next leg on a free and comfortable lane. On the contrary, the inside, again, you want to understand what you want, potentially actually wants to push if there is one boat or pack of boat and you're the leeward or the inside boat, you want to push them all the way to the ley line, okay? Or to be ready when they are getting to the ley line, you need, you need to think about, okay, what's going to be? Often I like to put myself with my head as the other boat. What will I do? What will I try to do? What will what will my aim will be if I will be on the other boat? And this is where you want to think about the time of jibe is not specific area. It's an air, not specific spot. It's an area. So when you're coming to this area, to this red, as you see here on the this picture, this area, you want to start thinking, okay, I'm on the inside. My goal is actually to push the boat all the way to the lane line. Potentially they're over the lane. I'm jibing with the lane line. Everything is easy, but it's not happening. So what are the other boats will try to do? Those on the same, which will, will try to get out of there soon. Those uh, boats on the outside, they might want to stay a bit longer for a good pressure, good air, but they will eventually they will try to jive in and you need to be ready for that. One thing that I like to do in those situations is all the time, like I said earlier, is to prioritize the next leg and pack. If you are trying to perfect the timing of the jive on the perfect wave, on the perfect shift, people will, will be ready for you there. Everyone wants to jibe on a perfect chief. Okay, and then you're jibing and someone jibing on top of you. Now you did it on a perfect time. So maybe at that moment you look amazing, but we're going to have a long way on the opposite tack and then someone is sitting on you. So you cannot be as fast as you were earlier on. Sometimes it's, uh, it's worth to pay a small price earlier in order to upgrade your position towards the next big chunk, the next leg or the next tack. 
So some of the common situation we have on a down on those time to jibe. And I'm talking uh, mostly now when we are on starboard tack on the right hand side. And now let's talk about the perspective of the outside boat. Again, like we said, we have a clear air, but we need to start thinking when we are approaching to this time to jibe of an opportunity. Opportunity can be a good shift, use it. If you can do jibe now and cross the pack behind you and position yourself inside, use it. Maybe you caught a couple of good waves. We have it often on the on wavy days that we serve a couple of good waves, we disconnect from a pack or you can jive a perfect, amazing jive on a long wave. Or maybe the boat in the back got into a fight with another boat, the spinnaker got uh, flapping or collapsed. Or maybe they're arguing, which we all know. <laughs> we have a lot of teammates around us that are arguing a lot. If someone ever sailed against me, he knows very well that I used to argue a lot with my skipper, <laughs> and very loudly. And so every opportunity of that is a good way to upgrade your position. Try to think, prioritize less the outside and try to prioritize more the inside the next step. On the contrary, the opposite, when we are on the inside. When we are on the inside, we want to stick um, our bow to the, the about to stand, what I like to call, to push the opponents towards all, you're on starboard, right? They cannot jive so easily. So if you stay close enough to them and be ready for the jive, you can force them all the way to the lane line and then you can jive whenever you're comfortable and then you have a clear all the next stack. So sometimes toward this, towards this time to, of the second peak of the time to jive, you kind of want to so close and be ready for the boat ahead of you. If they jive, you want to jive on top of them. One thing you don't want to do, like I mentioned earlier, is to be in the sandwich. Again, sandwich, it means you most likely are slower than potential boat speed or that the boat ahead of you holding you slow or the boat ahead behind you is preventing you to sell a perfect and the perfect DMG or holding you the a clear rail behind you. Or, or if the outside leg, the outside, um, lane is gaining a lot if you have good speed you're not there like i said earlier the outside boat is there and if the inside leg the inside lane or the new tack the windward side after you jibe is better you're still not not, not there so what you want to think again like we said earlier is the mental switch you have to understand that you don't want to be there and find every opportunity if it's boat handling technique a wave doing a sharp surprise jibe one of the things we had in our toolbox is two things. One is surprise jibe, and second is a fake jibe. Again, so on the higher level, sometimes we used to do a lot of maneuver in the boat, like we are preparing to the jibe, and we actually, the boat behind us fell to the strap, jibed away, and then suddenly we open a window and we can wait a little bit more. And now we are the leeward boat holding the boat to windward all the way to the ley line and we can choose better timing when to jive. So a quick jive, a surprise jive or a fake jive can work great on this situation. Like I said in the beginning, few, you need to have few types of jives in your toolbox and few elements. All this scenario, we have the opposite situation on the other side of the, the downwind we were talking about the, start, the, the right side of the downwind. We also have the left-hand side of the downwind. And the difference over there is that we are sailing on port, jibing to starboard. And besides the fact that you need, if you're jibing on starboard, you are, you are require, requiring the right of way and you need to give the other boat opportunity to give you room. That's the only limitation over there. So it's a, you just need a, a little bit, a small separation. You can head up a little bit and then make a jibe. So you can choose the, the differences over there. So you can choose the timing of the jibe and, and you, it's, you have much more flexibility and comfortable to choose when exactly you want to jibe on this 2080 or the third rule or 7030 or on the perfect chief pressure gas. So it's the same situation, the same mindset, just easier to and operate. Quick uh, illustration about, fun illustration about how you want to approach that. 
and the, the right boat, the, the green boat is the outside, just what they want to do, the blue boat and the red boat or the other gray boats are the sandwich. So it's the blue boat, you want to push the opponent, stick your bow to stand, avoid, avoid for them to jive. The green boat, we should find the opportunity to jive in and, or to soak low, not just jiving, just to put pressure on the pack behind you. And the red boat is that the sandwich, we don't want to be there. And um, I think it's so far for today. Well, perfectly on mark on one hour. I'm more than happy to hear a lot of questions now. And more than that, I would like uh, yes. you have my social media here and my email. So if someone wants the access of this presentation or the full file, please feel, feel free to reach out for me. Uh, or to ask any question now, any questions, doubt. Rudy, we do have, um, we have a question from Bernat again, and he, um, he's wondering how you fit wind oscillations into the downwind plan and how much importance you would give them relative to your positioning and tactics approach. Um, we're talking about the, 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 the wind shift or wind trends. If we have consistent shift, I will put it in my strategy and my, my plan A. And, and to see how it will affect the downwind, it will become more, if it's where consistent shift, it will, the downwind will become one more, one leg tack, 90%. And if we actually have, I'm not saying no the shifts, shifts uh, obviously give us a lot of board lengths gains a lot, if you're doing it the opposite. Like I said earlier in the beginning, two things is that, on the downwind, our angles are much lower, especially if Bernard is working with the optics, um, they're almost saying by the lead, almost straight line to the, to the marks. So even if there is a shift, the gain from one shift, you don't separate, you don't have the leverage of the angle, the separation is much smaller. So the shifts are not as big as you can, to one thing. And the other thing is that the pressure becoming so much more important because of that. And the downwind, when we have more pressure, most of the boat, I think 99% of the boat can sail much lower. So more pressure give you almost like a header. So it's actually taking over a big, uh, uh, a, a good shift. And not like an upwind, if you have more pressure, you go a bit faster, definitely, but your angles are not changing that much. So I will prioritize at any point, clear air and pressure towards the downwind. And of course, if you have, we, we talked about it, if it's on the sets um, or the timing of the jibe, you want to prioritize what is the right shift, uh, what is the right shift and when is to operate. If you have a, obviously on the downwind, if you have a header, you want to continue, but if you have a lift to use this opportunity to do jibe if, you, if possible, or to think about, okay, I sailed quite a long time on this header on a downwind. Soon, potentially I will have this this shift, so I need to start thinking about it. Say, the same like the second pick. I need to start thinking how to position myself in the right position to so low to use opportunity, maybe even to jibe earlier on a, on a header because you know that soon enough it will shift. So if you jibe again, paying a small price, not to sell all the perfect time on the shift, but position yourself so that when the shift comes, you're already on the right position. Awesome. Um, we have uh, Johnny Norfleet is wondering what software you're using to animate the boat situations. Hey, he's more than welcome to contact me. I spend hours on hours on a, on a, um, Acrobat illustration. And um, how do you call it? Um, I forgot the name of the program, but they're basically through illustration. Adobe. Adobe, Adobe illustration. And it's, it takes hours to prepare all the boats and understand how you shift all the spinning care and changing their, their tracking. Once you figure it out and once you have a template, every illustration like this takes another half an hour to edit. But more, feel free to reach out and contact and 
we can talk and I, will, I can give you a brief how to do those kind of things. Perfect. And the, the chalkboard um, moving illustrations, those were done on what was um, it? So I have, I, what I'm using a lot, especially since we moved to the Zoom era, I have a, I have a whiteboard on, a, on my iPad and I'm doing airplay and mirroring my screen. There is whiteboard over there. I just, I have few designs of few, few boats and I playing and moving them. I'm more than happy to jump out for a second, just to show that an example. One of the things when I'm working with kids, or when I'm working online, when I'm doing coaching online, I have this um, whiteboard. It's a, there's a lot of apps for that on that, and you, can, you need to find an app that you can import an image. And then I have this board that I can make it bigger, smaller, and sail around the race course. And I have it ready for at the fit of boats here. So again, it's a simple app on the iPod and I can, I can actually can draw things here, different type of things. I have like tool set, whatever I want to draw over there and I can erase. It's a, a, a simple app for a um, whiteboard, but the only key is actually to, to be able to import those small boats that you can play with that instead of trying to draw an awkward boat. Awesome. Um, really nice presentation, Udi. I think um, it's a lot to digest, right? A lot of different yeah. components. Um, I guess maybe something helpful would be for everyone listening in what kind of the steps are that you kind of start with when you're working with new sailors to get them kind of falling in line um, with this development so that they really lock in their downwind tactics. Yeah, the, just to clarify the, 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 the program that I did all the, the this, illustration it's after effects and the illustration so just to design those boards takes time and to to do that i'm more than happy to help that or anything else like i said i think what you said just is is, a, is the most important like i said in the beginning to have a pattern to to build a pattern and then once you have a pattern make sure that your sailor is setting follow this pattern and then if you see that this pattern is not working then you can adjust it but if every time the sailor is doing and it's not just for downwind, it's for every aspect of the sailing or every aspect in life. If you're every time doing something else, you don't know what is right and wrong. If you have the pattern, you have, you can find what's working very well for you statistically. And again, we are sailing, on, we are doing racing and we have series of, um, of races. So we want an average consistently better results. And that's what you want to look for patterns or code words that you know what your game plan is. Another note, um, as you see, just for everyone, I was I was hoping to have it ready by this week, but a lot of technical and like we're still working to perfect this uh, um, tool. As you as you guys know, so I, I I did my master's in sports psychology and I'm working a lot on this field. I'm about to launch an app that actually it's a self assessment, and this app is designed. It's called Performance Profile App. It will be out in a week or two. So that will be the logo. We have a website now for that just before pre-launch. It will be on the App Store and the Google Play. And it will help you to break down your sailing or any kind of sport that you're doing or even business or anything else in life to find the, the skills or attributes that work in for you. And then to do the self-assessment, it's subjective, but then also over there, you will learn how to actually... and to learn how to, assay, to enhance those performance and skills or attributes that you want to work or are important for you. So it's a, an amazing app that based on a, the research and literature in the sports psychology field that you guys should be, by next week, hopefully we'll have a pilot and you guys should be able to reach out and get it. It's, it would be an amazing tool which have a lot of cool features in it. Excellent. So that wraps up all the questions. Um, I just want to um, emphasize that Udi is available. I mean, feel free to reach out to him. I know he does active coaching 
out in the San Francisco Bay Area um, with the Peninsula Youth Sailing Foundation. Um, as, much, but, as much as we can now with the corona. Yeah, but warming up, right, to get out on the water, but um, also working on the Zoom platform, so with consults and whatnot. So if you're working with your team and want some advice, um, definitely reach out to Udi and see um, how he can help you from a sports psychology aspect. You've worked with a couple different sports teams. Um, I think that's an important component to uh, coaching sailing, which is a nice addition that you provide. So definitely a lot of insight that you share. Yeah. And again, we were going to continue right next week, same hour. Yep. We're going to dig into this black diamond. And of course, if you have questions and if you want, you need to process those sleepover, those things that elements that we had here, we can we touch base on that next week, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Bring questions to next Tuesday, same time, um, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and we can go through questions from this week's presentation and also um, hopefully get in some new questions for next week. Yes. So awesome. Well, With that, I, I, um, go ahead. I want to say thank you for everyone to have the time to jump into this live. And I know a lot of people, if it's from Israel or Europe, <laughs> everyone are texting here. Um, join into that so thank you very much for the late hours of joining us and i know that everyone are busy these times is unique for all of us all around the world so stay together be safe if it's not just for you for the people that you know and the older population we have to keep them safe be smart about it it's not worth anything and stay well and healthy yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Udi. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, Udi, for being part of the portal. Please join us next Tuesday for the follow-up of this presentation. And there's other live sessions going on throughout the week on the Starboard portal. Um, we encourage you to keep joining us um, as we go forward and know that your membership and your support is what helps these programs um, continue on. Um, so again, thank you, Yes. Um, Udi for being with us. Thanks everyone for tuning Thank in. Thank you, Justine, and you're sailing <laughs> and the Starboard Portal. I think what you're what you guys are doing is amazing. It's tools and information that will be the kids of or the sailors a benefit. Amazing. So that's a great activity, and I'm I'm proud and honored to be part of it. Thank you guys. Yeah, and uh, the honor is all ours. It's great to have you um, on Udi, and uh, look forward to next week. So thanks everyone. Yes. Bye everyone.